May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning, friends. It is so wonderful to look out on your beautiful faces this morning here at Pleasant Hill Community Church, where we like to say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we do mean that, whether you're here in person with us this morning or you're joining us online, you are always welcome here. Uh, The first thing that I would like to bring up in our announcements this morning is our stewardship materials in Boyce Hall. I'm sure that you saw them as you came in. There is a packet for every member laid out on the table in alphabetical order. And I grabbed mine first thing this morning and went back to my office and was reading it. And I was just so impressed with the job that was done putting the materials together, the beautiful writing, and the pictures in there. Um, So please, if you're able to get one right away and start reading it, I think you'll, you'll really see that it's a beautiful reflection of who we are here at Pleasant Hill Community Church. This evening, we will be showing another documentary, this one called Private Violence, and that will be shown at 6.30 p.m. in the romp room, which is right over there. Um, And we have uh, several events that I'm just going to let you go ahead and read. Um, One thing I do want to lift up that's not listed in announcements, but it's something that's becoming very special, and that is our Wednesday Vesper service. We had another one this week, and this service is becoming so meaningful to those of us who are participating, and people who come in who have not been to it before are just really taken with the sanctity of the event. So if you're able to join us for our Vesper service, please do. And I will let you go ahead and read the rest of the announcements. So with that, let us extend to each other the blessing of Christ's peace. Peace be with you. Good morning. On this beautiful morning, let's join together in the responsive call to worship. Too often, the best doesn't happen to us because we don't expect it to happen. Too often, 
Too often, our fear of failure robs us of the need to risk what we could do with the life we have been given. To celebrate the God of our lives means to throw open the door to our heart and stand in awe of the amazing. To know that we are children of God with great promise. Amen. Let's pray together in unison as we open our worship. At this junction on our journey, we heed your call, O God. We gather as your people looking for new life for our life. We gather as your imperfect children, aware of our moments of selfishness and ambition, our tendency for cynicism and fear, our times of confusion and doubt. Yet your grace abounds, O Lord. Your everlasting love awaits us. So we come as we are. With our shortcomings, yes, but also with our gifts, remembering that we are created in your image. We come and your word nourishes us. Your spirit calls us. We come desiring to walk your ways of justice, to hear your words of wisdom and renewal. We come to extend, like yours, our open hands. May our worship renew in us the audacity to follow you and love you every day, wherever you call us. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 417. It's also on the screen. This is the day of new beginnings. Please be seated. And now let us get comfortable in our seats. Nice and loose with your feet firmly on the ground. And begin to breathe.
I am breathing. Breathing out anxiety. Breathing in an awareness. Every breath is a gift. Breathing out despair, breathing in a new resolve to love harder. Breathing out worry, breathing in wonder. Breathing out blame, breathing in a sense of my own power and agency. Breathing out fear, breathing in a belief there's still some good in this world, a goodness stronger than evil, and it's worth fighting for. Breathing out judgment, breathing in understanding, breathing out cynicism. Breathing in gratitude. I am breathing. Breathing in and breathing out. Amen. Please join me in our collect prayer. Open now our ears, O God, that we might hear your word. Open now our minds, O God, that we might receive your word. Open now our hearts, O God, that we might accept your word and make it the rule for our lives. Amen. Hear now these holy words the future, present. A wise rabbi was walking along a road when he saw a man planting a tree. The rabbi asked him, how many years will it take for this tree to bear fruit? The man answered that it would take 70 years. The rabbi asked, are you so fit and strong that you expect to live that long to eat its fruit? The man answered, I found a fruitful world because my forefathers planted for me. So I will do the same for my children. This is from the Jewish Midrash. In last week's scripture, Jesus and the disciples were on the road to Jerusalem. Today's reading, Mark 10, 46 through 52, continues the journey. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, Have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This ends today's reading. Thank you, Carolyn. They smelled him before they heard him. They heard him before they saw him. The dirty, unwashed beggar interrupting not just the silence, but the cleanness and the sacredness of the moment. 
intruding the quiet anticipation with which everyone else was clinging to Jesus' words. Like the fly that won't quit buzzing or the workman down the street who won't quit hammering, his persistent shouting ruining the peace and the people understandably irritable and intent on stopping the noise. But to the credit of the crowd, as soon as they see Jesus stop and call the man, they take their cues and change their attitude. They suddenly see the blind man for the underdog he is, and they become instant fans. Take heart, cheer up, courage. They egg him on to victory. I find it remarkable that Bartimaeus even called out to Jesus. Remarkable that he found the metal to shout out as Jesus passed by. Bartimaeus was a blind man, which means he was permanently unemployed. No disability check, no Medicaid, no safety net, no means by which to support himself, no home to go to and most likely friendless. In that time and place, to be physically disabled was to be cast to the margins of society, devalued and dismissed. It was to depend upon the charity of people who looked on you with disdain. Imagine the stress. Imagine the shame of sitting by the road in the dust outside the gates of the city, knowing that all who pass you regard you with contempt, if they regard you at all. How did he lose his sight? Was it aging or tragedy? Was it reading under the covers at night or staring into the sun? Was it too much darkness? or strain, or stress, or was it a general loss of wonderment? When did he stop seeing the beauty of the world? When was he left staring into the black abyss? When did things grow so dim that his eyelids drooped as if in slumber? Of course he had heard about Jesus. You couldn't help but hear about Jesus. His eyes might have been shot, but his hearing was perfectly fine. And word traveled fast around town. So by the time Jesus and his followers left Jericho, even a blind, unemployed, forgotten beggar on the outskirts of town had heard tell of the man Jesus and the miracles he performed. But what use did he have for miracle workers or fantastic stories about magical healings? He'd learned long ago not to put too much stock into lofty promises. He'd been disappointed too many times. And didn't it take all he had just to get through the day, to fight off the depression, beg a few coins, find his next meal? It truly is a wonder he spoke out at all. It's a wonder he didn't just lay low, hunker down over his cup, and wait for the crowd to pass. Because anxiety locks up the imagination. When we're anxious, all we can see is the trial at hand. We turn grim, lose our sense of humor, our shoulders grow tense, our breath gets shallow, and our vision narrows like we've sprouted blinders. We become lousy problem solvers. And Bartimaeus had plenty of good reason to be anxious. Yet somehow he managed to unlock his imagination. Somehow, as he sat there on the curb that day, he was able to envision the possibility that one rule-changing rabbi named Jesus might just be a game-changer. Somehow, he found the moxie to break from his worries and take a chance on that miracle worker. 
to take a chance that this was no snake oil salesman, but the real deal. He shouted out, twice. I'm struck by the fact that although he stops, Jesus makes a blind man walk to him. I mean, it just doesn't seem very Jesus-y to me to stand there like it's a game of Marco Polo when it's no game at all to the man who is crying for mercy. Why doesn't God rush to our side when we are in need? Why must we stand up and walk when we are the ones who can't see where he is and he's the one who knows right where we are? And isn't it even more remarkable that Jesus had enough patience to let it all unfold? Compassionate man that he is, he must have been dying to run over and wrap this man in his arms. He must have felt the urge to scorn the crowd for their initial rebukes and prove them wrong by his show of love. And of course, he could have rushed forward in compassion and squeezed the crowd out of the moment. He could have forced them to be observers, outsiders to the event. But instead, he offers an invitation to let them offer their own invitation to the man in need of mercy. He stands still. Call him, he said to the crowd, giving them a chance to change their tone, a chance to participate in the miracle, a chance to cheer on the stranger as he reached for his healing. I'm amazed that although he is blind, that doesn't stop Bartimaeus from leaping up and groping his way to healing. Healing always feels like groping, doesn't it? Like you're grasping for straws, like you're following a mirage, like you're teetering on a ledge, like there aren't any railings, like you'll fall off any second and be more scarred than ever, like you might never get there, like you've no idea if the healing is light years away or just around the bend. The movement towards healing always takes place with fuzzy vision and an unclear path. Just the soft hint of a whisper calling you forward. Sometimes the crowds boo you, silence you, poke fun and rebuke you. Sometimes you are astounded to hear people cheering you on, believing in you when you don't have enough faith of your own. You cannot control the outcome of the timing. You cannot manipulate things in your favor, and that makes you feel as helpless as a beggar. But your one job is this. Don't give up. Stay loyal to your healing. Keep asking for what you know you need. Don't let a mob of people shut you down because somewhere in that throng is a savior. Keep on searching until you find your deliverance. Don't be too mad if you are made to get up and walk because it is the journey that heals you. And that journey is your faith. We think that faith is an idea in our heads, but faith isn't in our heads. Or we think that faith is something we feel in our hearts, but faith isn't in our hearts. Faith is in our legs. Faith is in our bodies. Faith is in how we move, where we go. Faith is the journey we take. And the faithless are those who stay put. Though the text doesn't say the crowd must have parted in order to make a path, they were all over Jesus, but now here was a blind man on the fringes who needed to get to him. So they cleared out of the way. They didn't steer him or push him or force him. They didn't point the way to Jesus because the man couldn't see them. But they made a clearing. 
a wide open space in which he could walk. They didn't clutter the way with their opinions. They gave no advice. Get glasses, try LASIK, try religion. Spit and mud are rumored to work. They said nothing of the sort. They just made Jesus accessible, that's all. They stopped interfering with their rebukes and their wisdom. They parted like the Red Sea and let the man pass through to his land of promise. Richard Rohr says, true seeing is the heart of spirituality today, but most of us have to be taught how to see. Which leads me to wonder, was it Bartimaeus who gained his sight that day? Or was it the crowd who learned most about what it means to see? I don't know if it's the pain in the world or the unanswered prayers or my own lofty logic that keeps me from seeing, keeps me from seeing Jesus heal people. It's a long journey, and he's healed me too, bit by bit, piece by piece. But sometimes I'm not so sure I'm seeing yet. Sometimes I'm still cynical and hard to impress, and I still rely on my skepticism to keep me safe from disappointment. But I'm starting to learn that I'd rather suffer a disappointment or two than never get moving at all. I'd rather fall and skin my knees on my way to healing than sit on my rear end and scorn the difficulties of standing up. I'd rather grope my way towards Jesus than keep questioning why he seems to be playing games with me, hiding, standing still. I'd just rather move. You know, I'd rather put one foot in and see whether or not the sea parts than stay put with the assumption that there's no possible way through the chaos. I'd rather trust the voices that say, take heart, cheer up, courage, he's calling you, than the voices that say, shut up, stay down, you're not worth it. I'd rather be blind Bartimaeus with a shot at life than a nervous lady who is too ashamed to beg. But most of all, I am amazed that even after you regain your sight, the journey isn't over. The first thing you'll see is the road. The Jesus way continues if you follow your eyes like Bartimaeus. May it be so, and may it be with you all according to God's word. Amen. And now, let's rise and join together in singing at the font we start our journey.
Please be seated. I don't see any prayer requests from Fletcher this morning, but I have a joy I would like to lift up this morning. On Friday afternoon, I did a wedding here at, in our sanctuary, and it was the wedding of Rosie and Yolanda, two of our newest members. <laughs> It was such a beautiful, beautiful experience all the way through from our first conversation until right now. It's still, my heart is so full of the experience and the blessing that these two women bring to each other and to us. And now I would invite your prayers Yes. My brother is going to have a major oral surgery coming up, and it's complicated by his health issues. Tom, we lift up Tom, who is having major oral surgery tomorrow, which is complicated by health issues. Yes, Karen. My brother Michael, he's, he's having a birthday today. Oh, happy birthday to Michael today, Karen's brother. Yes, Rebecca. Yeah. We give thanks for the rain and the happy gardens. Yes, Margaret. Yes, yes. Yes, we give thanks this morning for the life of Finley Brown, who, as you know, I'm sure everyone received my message, he died yesterday. Yes, Sue. Yes. Your concern, I, I got good news in, I mean, that, I'm very thankful for that. that yes, we're still keeping them in their prayers, but I couldn't help but thinking that part in my sermon about the healing and the journey of healing and how that really uh, mirrors Ben's journey. So we continue to keep them in our prayers this morning. Yes, Jean. Oh. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Kurt. this weekend and for the joyful time um, those of us here had with the board as we rejoiced in our joint work together as we mm. move forward as a community. Yes, absolutely. And request <coughs> prayers for wisdom to our son Bruce who is in the stage of life where he is beginning to think about what do I do when I am 65 or 67? <laughs> um, they are big decisions he is in the process of making right in these coming days and weeks. We offer our prayers to Bruce as he discerns his way forward in life. Yes, Carolyn. To follow up on Kurt's prayer, I'd just like to say we're thankful to have Mike Reedinger 
in our congregation this morning. He is on the Hi. board of Uplands, but he's also our past Chisholm president. Okay. So he's known Uplands for a long time. All right. Welcome, Mike. It's great. Uh, bring greetings from Joanna Diagostino. From where? Joanna Diagost. Oh, Joanna. I know I'm Joanna. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Welcome. <laughs> yes, Mark. It's Bert. I think getting for our family. We traveled up to Maryland last weekend, and uh, I've been quality time with my older sister, who's not doing very well, and my younger sister, who turned 80 or turning 80. And we had a mini family reunion with four generations now. Wonderful. A prayer of thanksgiving for family and four generations gathering together. It's always a happy time. Yes, Mary. I'll second that motion. Uh, Bill and I just traveled to te Texas for a year to celebrate Bill, uh, for a year. Uh, for a week. <laughs> We offer up thanks for Peyton and for a good time in Texas for Mary and Bill. Yes, Doug. I think uh, Sharon and I would like to thank the congregation and for their Thanksgiving, which she was finally cast free from her wrist. And uh, it would be a great Thanksgiving for all the support this congregation has given us uh, and will continue to give us, I assume, Wonderful. Thanks for sharing re the removal of the cast and thanksgiving for all of your support that Doug is sure will continue, and I'm sure it will too, because that's who we are. Yes, Cameron. We'll offer up prayers for Bella that she's able to find a church that speaks to her heart. Yes, Terry. Prayers for all of the hot spots in the world, Gaza, Sudan, Ukraine, everywhere where things are going on and people are being put to the mercy of forces I don't understand. Yes, Karen. realize our faith extends beyond church walls and and we could really be instruments of healing in our wider community yes with each other and we don't all have to think the same way but we could only cooperate yes because there are more and more homeless people we lift up this morning prayers for the homeless and prayers for cooperation among all of us so that we can eliminate something that is so unnecessary. Yes, Mark. Yes. Yes, we lift up our country that is deeply divided and pray that once this contentious election is over, we can somehow 
come back together as one country, one people. Let us pray silently. We open our hearts to the God that is within, around, and beyond. This God we know, glimpse, and are yet to discover whose voiceless words invite us personally, intimately, to a creative dance across the cosmos. And yet this very magnificent God is also waiting to be discovered in refugee campsites, run-down shopping centers, war-torn suburbs, rancid rubbish tip where barefoot children play asking that we redress the inequalities of life. And so in this moment, we ask God to search us and know our hearts and thoughts, to prick our conscience where we could love more generously, live more humbly, act more justly, so that the world we want to see comes nearer for the sake of love, in the power of love, in the name of love, and saying his words together. Our Mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Next Sunday, November 2nd, will be the final offering of this year for the Power of the Penny, which benefits the La Vestita Center, our partner in ministry in Santiago to Cuba. This month, uh, Justice and Mission here at Pleasant Hill Church has been focusing on domestic violence and abuse right here in Cumberland County in our own lives and families. Our mission partner in Cuba, the La Vestita Center, has a long history of engaging in gender-related issues in Cuba with education, advocacy, training, and support programs for women there. Doesn't matter where we're located, we respond to similar issues of need. If you've never been to Cuba and would like to visit, you would be welcome on the United Church of Christ Cuba Study Seminar, which happens every year. It will be January of 2025. If this is something maybe you've been thinking about for years or just started thinking about this minute, contact Sue Peoples or I, who participated in this most recently, Hugh and Rebecca, who also recently have traveled to Cuba. So. First of all, just remember, next Sunday, power of the penny. Bring your change, your power, your pennies, your bills, your checks, whatever. They are all welcome, and they will be shared with the La Vestita Center. There'll be power of the penny containers in Boys Hall and by the door over there. So as you enter, you can put your contribution in. Thank you. Giving. Giving can be described as providing love or other emotional support, caring. With love for others, we set aside time in our service to present our offerings in support of the ministry and mission of our church. 
Our holy words this morning was the story of a man planting a tree for the future he would not live to see. His world was fruitful because his forefathers planted seeds. Now he is planting, the, planting for those who would come after him. I believe our church offering is much like that, the planting of seeds. For those worshiping here, there are offering plates at each sanctuary entrance and one here on the table in front. If you did not deposit an offering and a plate on your way in, you feel free to get up and do so during our offertory music or as you leave the sanctuary. Those of you joining us online are invited to help us plant seeds. You may give to our church by going to our church website, Pleasant Hill uccTN.org. In the upper right, you will see a give tab. Let's give as we are able. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing your gifts. Let us pray. Loving creator, we are recipients of so many gifts. May the offerings we bring be as seeds planted for the future, assuring your work will continue for generations to come. Guide each of us as we discern how we might best support your work, be it financial gifts, gifts of time and talents, or any combination of the three. We give thanks for all we have received. Amen. Our closing hymn is This Little Light of Mine, 
Let's shine. got to do more of that. <laughs> Will you please join me in our closing prayer? Oh Lord, may I so live that those who know me and know not thee may want to know thee because they know me. Amen. Blessed are you who trust in the Almighty and put your hope in God. You are like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots to the river. When heat comes, you do not fear. Your leaves remain green. You do not grieve the year of drought nor cease to bear fruit. Blessed as you are, go and struggle with the power of the Spirit to break down all the walls. Amen.
We are so glad you could join us this morning at Pleasant Hill Community Church. We'd like you to invite you to join us in person if you are in the area. Join us for our meet and greet time at 945 before the service to talk with members and friends and then worship with us at 1030 each Sunday morning. All of God's people are welcome to our service. No matter where you are at in your life's journey, you're welcome here. To find more about who we are, please go to our website at pleasanthillucctn.org or see us on our Facebook page. Until next week, thank you for worshiping with us this morning.